a little bit when we did the fan mail. The two part fan mail was part two of just doing some question and answers, trying to grapple with some of this stuff, which I think is almost nearly mandatory to do, if not mandatory, for such a book as Isaiah. So we are actually, this is the third to last time for Isaiah. We are nearing the end of it. Um, this week and next week, we'll do the 16th and 17th letters. Then Mahmoud will be sharing his testimony the following week. And then the final week, which is the Sunday after Labor Day, we'll be doing letter 18, which is certified mail. And uh, we'll be done. You'll all be experts on the book of Isaiah. So there you have it. If you've been reading along, we've actually been tracking through the whole book. And you will have read the whole book if you follow along with each section. And so today, we're going to continue with the series, Return to Sender. Subtitled, A Prophetic Postman Delivers a Messianic Message with God's Stamp of Approval to a World Gone Postal. This is, as i said on the whiteboard, the 16th letter entitled, Pushing the Envelope. And it is based on Isaiah chapter 56, verse 9 to 59, verse 21. So, when we last left the prophetic postman, he was giving us the admonition to act like where we are going. You have a permanent address. Make sure you are living there, not just by divine appointment, but by our constant choice. Now, at the same time, if you guys were here a few weeks ago, at the same time, Isaiah is pointing at God's mobile home outside parked in your driveway as the <laughs> only means to take us there, but not before asking this prophetic question, which we talked about. So what difference does it make that the suffering servant would endure all of that suffering? That is basically the nomenclature, the title that Isaiah uses for Jesus Christ when he's predicting what was going to be happening 700 years in the future. And he would call him the suffering servant more often than not. And they are usually based in four compartments that are tucked into the book of Isaiah that we call the servant song. We've talked about those as well. So that's where he gets this question. What difference does it, make, does it make that the suffering servant would endure, when he does, seven centuries later, all of that suffering? Isaiah's first two answers that we also talked about were this. For Israel, it means restoration. That's what the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ would mean. For the Gentiles, that'd be most of us, I presume, it means an invitation to come to Christ and be grafted into this whole enterprise. But now there's number three. For rebellious sinners, or I might say those who, are, who insist on pushing the envelope, it means accusation. Now, pushing the envelope is an interesting turn of phrase, as it were. And, of course, uh, I did something here that's probably, when it comes to physics, impossible. <laughs> Nonetheless, we've got this phrase. What does it mean? So I did a compilation um, of what this definition might mean of the phrase pushing the envelope. Took it from the Internet Free Dictionary, and there's a reason it's free. Um, also, <laughs> Webster's and Collins Dictionary, and so here's my compilation. Pushing the envelope would be defined as this. To expand on, exceed, or test the limits of the established norm or standard. To go beyond the usual or normal limits by doing something new, dangerous, to a greater degree or in a more extreme way than it has ever been done before. So, using and extracting portions of that definition, I want us to take a look at seven pushy, bulging envelopes that we are all, in one way or another, in greater or small ways, confronted with. With only the last of the seven actually being able to take us Beyond, and I will explain that when we get there. So let's begin with the first envelope. In the first envelope, we come down with a bump from the heights of the vision of our forwarding address, which is what we talked about in letter number 15 last time. We land with a bump to the grim realities of inadequate leaders, better known to Isaiah as substandard shepherds. God was not kidding when he called his people the children of Israel. The nation would return to their promised land with all those kids. So many that, according to the Apostle Paul, 735 years later, they would have filled the entire province of Galatia. Galatians 4, 27. They just needed to be led properly. 
Not like in these pre-exilic days when Isaiah was writing this, 685 B.C., when a good shepherd was anything but. God's first accusation is towards a particular group of rebellious sinners he would just as soon have had for lunch, or be lunch. Those supposed leaders of his people, the Lord's watchmen, his blind and ignorant shepherds lying around, sleeping and greedily dreaming like useless, silent watchdogs who never bother to sound out danger, Will Robinson, in any circumstance, whose frequent insatiable drunken parties of personal gain ring out like a triangular dinner bell for all of the wild animals from both field and forest to come and get it. And come and get it they did. Open your Bibles to chapter 56 of the book of Isaiah. Chapter 56, verse 9. And I'm in the New International Version, as usual. <coughs> come, wild animals of the field. Come, wild animals of the forest, come and devour my people. For the leaders of my people, the Lord's watchmen, his shepherds, are blind and ignorant. They're like silent watchdogs that give no warning when danger comes. They love to lie around, sleeping and dreaming like greedy dogs. They are never satisfied. They are ignorant shepherds, all following their own path and intent on personal gain. Come, they say, let's go get some wine and have a party, and let's all get drunk. And then tomorrow, we'll do it again and have an even bigger party. Now, what with all the good people passing away, uh, according to Isaiah 57, verse 1, or dropping like flies, I should say, by God's mercy, it was the godless conduct of the leaders that caused Judah to fall to Babylon. Had the prophets, priests, and rulers turned to God in repentance and faith, he would have intervened on their behalf, but they persisted in the rebellion with the people insisting on living on the lies passed down to them by their superficial, wayward leadership who lived their lives at public expense, which is a bottomless purse. In 685 B.C., substandard shepherds were pushing an envelope that would continue to be in circulation for another 280 years when an anonymous chronicler would hold the envelope up to the light and proclaim to all the nations until the end of time, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. But as it was, the Lord himself intervened, and in this case brought the Babylonians to destroy Judah and Jerusalem in order to teach the people, both <coughs> leaders and followers alike, that you can't despise God's word and get away with it. You can't then, and you can't now. The greatest threat to the redeemed is if they fail to listen by the Spirit to their Bibles. Make sure that you can always be found in care of God's word. Now here's a note. Today, the out-and-out -out denial of biblical faith is rarely the problem. You would think it would be that, but it's not. No, we're too sophisticated for that, or too cunning and too subtle. The problem is the prostitution of it, our biblical faith. We mingle biblical faith with its sworn enemies to such a degree that there is nothing left but a shell of itself. And then we wonder why it has no power to move us, and no stability to hold us. Some of the suspicious ingredients that might be added to holy writ would include liberal agendas, progressive philosophies, countercultures, prosperity gospels, secular humanism, and I love this, social media opinions. And there are plenty. <laughs> the politicians in Isaiah's day had no time for his remedies. Kindergarten stuff, they called it. But it is not exactly kindergarten stuff when we are accused of following those very same politicians by calling righteousness what is in fact an abomination. And it's fascinating how quickly those waters get muddied. And even the most astute biblical scholars can find themselves confused. And the two righteousness and abomination, they are tucked inside this first big, bulgy, pushy envelope 
which is the product of substandard shepherds. Which brings us to the second bulging envelope containing pushy, very pushy directions for our extreme waves. Look at Isaiah chapter 57, verse 14. God says, rebuild the road, clear away the rocks and stones so my people can return from captivity. The high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one, says this, I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. Here's more holy highway talk from Isaiah, if you've been with us in this series. Isaiah, the master of drama, which he is more often than not. So that his people could return from captivity, he has this analogy of a holy highway because he's very concerned with not only their external captivity, which they are bound for, and then will ultimately be released seven decades later, he's also concerned with their internal captivity, which all of us fight every single day of our lives with whatever may constrain us. And so we have learned the language of highway building appears all over the book all over the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah's is a highway, or sometimes it's called a path, or a road. It's, it's a built expressly upon that which the contrite can walk in order to return to God. But then as now, there has been a deliberate adoption of more crooked and tangled paths, attractive as they may be, even though those who traffic upon them will meet sin like a boomerang coming home. You can bank on it. Contrary to the roads that are crooked, winding their way to destruction and disintegration, this holy highway of Isaiah's, it, the roadbed is raised up above the surrounding countryside so that it can have an adequate foundation underneath it. All the bumps and the potholes have been symbolically removed so that nothing can stand in the people's way. All the bumps and the potholes, family ties, have been removed symbolically so that nothing can stand in your way, our way, or as the bumper sticker said in the 70s, one way, but there is another way. 750 years later, gatekeeper Jesus would call this way wide, and the preferred way, narrow. The wide other way is mapped out by people who do not know what it means to be just and good. Consequently, on the wide other way, there is no peace for the wicked. 57, 21. For them, it is all the churning mud and dirt of what we might call riptide warnings. And if you're from California, you've seen the, those red signs a lot on beaches. Isaiah 57, verse 20. There is abundant peace, however, both near and far but only for those who follow a godly, narrow path. All others are trotting upon the wide road or path, clinging to their bulgy, pushing envelope number three, which we will call dangerous devotion. Those pushing this particular envelope do so while making faces and sticking out their tongues, mocking God who calls them in the <coughs> Adulterous sons of witches from the world of the dead. I'm quoting the NIV here. Sinners and liars who have passionately climbed into bed or under a tree with any <coughs> small G goblet they can get their naked, oily, perfumed hands on. Worthless idols with rocks in their heads snatched from either mountains or valleys and dragged seductively behind closed doors. Look at Isaiah 57 verse 5. You worship your idols with great passion beneath the oaks and under every green tree. You sacrifice your children down in the valleys among the jagged rocks and the cliffs. Your gods are smooth stones in the valleys. You worship them with liquid offerings and grain offerings. They, not I, are your inheritance. Do you think all this makes me happy? It's not a rhetorical question, that is. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. We've come a long way from sacrificing children to the pagan god Moloch, and that's what Isaiah was referring to here. In our sophisticated modern world, however, the once deadly jagged rocks have now been replaced by rights to choose. Right alongside those with pro-life nerve endings, 
dulled over time by the idol of convenience. A video game instead of a conversation. A TV dinner instead of one around the table. A laptop instead of children crawling up in your lap. Wearing headphones instead of listening. Cell phones instead of soulmates. Internet instead of net worth. Scrolling instead of reading. Emoji instead of emotion. Looking at Facebook instead of sticking your face in a book. Or <laughs> the book. Here's a familiar formula against a society of instant gratification. Reproductive, electronic, or otherwise. But they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. We've talked about that verse, Isaiah 40, 31, at length in this series. But I did not mention, deliberately so, and this is the bad news, folks, that Isaiah 40, 31 has an evil twin. It's Isaiah 57, 10. <laughs> When the demon of idol worshiping, do it yourself salvation grips people, though evidence mounts that it is a burden we do not have the strength to bear, there always seems to be commensurate demonic strength for just one more try at self sufficiency. Look at Isaiah 57, verse 10. You grew weary in your strength, but you never gave up. Desire gave you renewed strength, and you did not grow weary. You grew weary in your search. You never gave up. And you had renewed strength, but it was in your own power or something worse, and you did not grow weary. That is called dangerous devotion. It is really another phrase for unbelief. A pushy envelope bulging with all that is groundless, sinful, inexcusable, and insulting to God. Look at Isaiah 57, verse 11. Are you afraid of these idols? Do they terrify you? Is that why you have lied to me and forgotten me in my words? Is it because of my long silence that you no longer fear me? Now, I will expose your so-called good deeds. None of them will help you. Let's see if your idols can save you when you cry to them for help. Why, a puff of wind could knock them down. If you just breathe on them, they'll fall over. But whoever trusts in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. Which brings us to pushy envelope number four, which is bulging with two very abnormal observances. Or I should say, healthy, appropriate observances that we have mutated into abnormality, which we do all the time. Isaiah's, Isaiah's accusation about these abnormal uh, observances are shouted like a trumpet blast, 58 verse 1. Don't be shy, he says. Tell the pious, fighting and quarreling, finger-pointing, rumor-mongering people who are just going through the motions of their sin. The first abnormal observance, the first of two, is their self-centered starvation diet. People skinny as reeds, 58 verse 5, bowing their ash-covered heads to the winds of attention getting. Look at Isaiah 58 verse 3. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why, I responded. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. Not learning a thing and only pretending that they want to be near God, these pious ones take on their own burlap yoke of oppression when they should be about the business of lifting real burdens off of others. Instead of having your cake and eat it too, you should take your food and share it with friends, relatives, and everyone in need. Then and only then will the dawning light of your salvation shine out from the darkness. A darkness of personal blindness within ourselves that up to now has hidden justice from view. You know, justice. That righteous standard of revealed truth and the life that goes with it which is so far beyond us. But instead, there is a wall of sheer blackness, no matter what time of the day, 
that people pathetically feel their way along looking for a supposed right way to live outside of God. Your light, conversely, should shine so brightly that the darkness around you should look like high noon. And even with the drying sun in the midday sky, your strength will be restored. You will be like a well-watered garden, an ever-flowing spring. God promises it. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11. Isaiah 58, verse 11. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. This phrase here in the New International Version, restoring your strength, in the Hebrew literally means equip your bones. I like that. To make you physically equipped to face life. Look at verse 12, Isaiah 58. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. And then you will be known as rebuilder, as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. Interesting little paragraph of, or phrase to insert here. But one does not need to travel very far in Israel to see ancient ruins that speak so eloquently of past human failure and loss. Um, on almost every skyline, there are archaeological tells, is what they call them, with foundations jutting out like broken teeth. Have you been laid bare for generation upon generation? Pictures like these are surely in Isaiah's mind as he addresses the second observance gone totally abnormal, which is in verse 13 of Isaiah 58. Verse 13. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day. And don't follow your own desires or talk idly. Then the Lord will be your delight, and I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. Once again, and we talked about this in Isaiah 56, verses 2 to 6, Isaiah argues against what I would call Sabbath sabotage by presenting the idea of a holy Sabbath rest that demands not suggest, but demands the consecrating of one's timetable to God. Marry it to God. Till death do you part. Consecrating your timetable <coughs> to God. And that's not the only thing you need to marry to God. And we're going to get to that in a week. Sneak preview. Therefore, the Sabbath day of rest is the test. Do you get that? They rhyme. Don't forget that. Sabbath day of rest is a test of what? Obedience. Pure and simple obedience, whether the heart delights in God or not. Yet the Lord's people, both then and now, us included, while looking back to their great salvation, still struggle, individually and collectively, with their own sinfulness and weakness, while they eagerly await the crowning fulfillment of what their own salvation actually means. And we do grapple with that. What does this actually mean? I am assured, I am forgiven, I am going to heaven, now what? Well, let's start with this. A regular keeping of the Sabbath should mark out those who sincerely join themselves to the Lord. Period. Let's not make it complicated, then it will cease to be restful. Will it not? And we're good at that too. Let's make this really complicated and top heavy, and then we'll just say, I can't do it, it's just too, too much. It's not a monolith. It's not. It's a mission. It's an invitation. But heed this warning. Whether you're fasting or Sabbathing or just plain living, don't pursue your own interests or desires. No idle talk that only makes your worship an outward show. The popular thing to do, but not the right thing to do. These abnormal observers had turned what Isaiah describes as a joyful house of prayer, Isaiah 56, 7, into what Jesus would describe seven centuries later as a den of thieves, Matthew 21, 13. A bizarre bazaar with worshiping and praying being substituted for buying and selling. You might call this a spiritual pantomime of sleight of hand, fancy footwork, and slick speech, which is the result of that fifth pushy envelope bulging with what I will call unusual hands, feet, and lips. Look at Isaiah chapter 59, verse 3. 
Your hands are the hands of murderers, and your fingers are filthy with sin. Your lips are full of lies, and your mouth spews corruption. Verse 7. seven. Their feet run to do evil, and they rush to commit murder. They think only about sinning. Misery and destruction always follow them. Now, fortunately, the underhanded actions of our hands, feet, lips, and even fingers are no match for the strong arm of God. Our animated gyrations and genuflecting are only a distracting expression of something inside us that has gone horribly wrong. This has all the makings of murderous hands, filthy fingers, evil feet, and lying lips operating against a suit-happy backdrop of dishonesty, corruption, and evil deeds pregnant with sinful offspring, producing an environment that I would admit is not for the squeamish. And no one cares if you don't like spiders and snakes. Everything from fresh eggs to fashionable clothing bears the trademark of made in sin with misery, destruction, and violence. Isaiah 59, verses 4 to 6. Bottom line, since the fall, the imagination and the thought processes for all of us have been corrupted. Verse 7 is interesting here. It says, they think only about sinning. The word here for think is the exact same word in the Hebrew found in chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, which reads, My thoughts are not your thoughts. We have two thinkers. We have one in 55, verses 8 and 9, and we have one here in 59, verse 7. In this case, however, they think only about sinning. It refers not to what God deems as fair and honest, but rather our own plans and schemes that we have mulled over and over and over and developed until they are ready to be hatched. And when they are, up from the ground crawls the walking dead, Isaiah 59, verse 10, crowling hungrily like predatory bears one minute and eerily moaning like mournful doves another. Context, folks. It's all about context. You think of a cooing dove. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Put that in the right context. Let me give you a real quick illustration here. We had, back in the day, when uh, our, our kids were growing up, this kind of a weird, it's got that electronic musical sound. It said Merry Christmas, and it lit, right? And it played a succession of all these weird electronic sounds, you know? So, you know, it's like, better watch out, man, and I cry. You know, it's all that little, you know, the little weird electronic sounds you get. It, has, it plays 20 songs. Well, this one did, and it lit. And then the lights would morph into greens and blues, and it was this dumb plasticky thing. I think my parents got us. That would not surprise me. Nonetheless, we put this thing up on a ledge in our dining room. And we went away. We went out of town one time. And I think there was either a storm or something that caused this blackout. And it was Christmas time, too. So you'd go up the street, you know, and it was beautiful. Everything was lit, you know. And we had our house all decorated with lights and wreaths and everything else. And uh, we came home this one night, and there had been a blackout, apparently the result of some storm. So the street was dark. And so I thought, hmm, this is not good. So, of course, leaving the kids. The kids are younger, so I'll leave them in the car, and I'll go in the front door and just check everything out because it's going to be pitch black, and I don't have a flashlight yet at all. So I open the front door, and for some, the way the little house was laid out, I could look down this long hall to the very window that faced our backyard, and that was the ledge where this Merry Christmas thing happened. Well, the Merry Christmas thing went into battery mode. <laughs> so the only thing lit in the house, or dare I say even on the block, was this <laughs> And it was doing this weird morphine color thing. It was the creepiest thing I've ever seen in my life. Why? Context. It's all about context. So in the dark of night, you like that kind of suspense mystery thing, right? The cooing of a dove could be terrifying. You know, pecking at your window. You know, something out of Alfred Hitchcock. That's what he's talking about here. Why? Why would this all digress to this point? Look at Isaiah chapter 59, verses 12 to 13. For our sins are piled up before God and testify against us. Yes, we know what sinners we are. We know we have rebelled and have denied the Lord. We have turned our backs on our God. We know how unfair and oppressive we have been, carefully planning our deceitful lives. Gratefully, this accusation that we have admitted to ourselves, does not fall on deaf ears of our rescuing God and rescue us, he does. Here's a question. Do our human thoughts need to be redesigned in the light of the suffering servant's fine example? I'll say that one more time. 
Do our human thoughts need to be re redesigned in light of the suffering servant's fine example? And you might say after even just this discussion up to now, well, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the answer is an emphatic no. I'm playing with words here, but the concepts are like night and day, and it's a huge difference here. The answer is no. Our human thoughts do not need to be redesigned in the light of the suffering servant's fine example. They need to be completely replaced by virtue of the suffering servant's ultimate sacrifice. That's what's at stake here. The ways and thoughts of God, same word, 55 verses 8 to 9, must replace the ways and thoughts of human beings, same word, 59 verse 7. And they need to be shifted. But the, shifted, the shifting is titanic for everyone. Replacement is our only hope. Redesigning will not do. No matter how much we delude ourselves into thinking that we as individuals or as a society are improving. We're getting better. Things are getting better. Well, that brings us to the sixth progressive envelope, the pushy progressive envelope of greater degrees. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 14 to 15, the prophet channels King Solomon from 280 years ago, who is trying unsuccessfully to instill his own brand of godly wisdom to his upstart son, Rehoboam, who would quickly and recklessly split his dad's royal kingdom under peer pressure, misconception, that was just more gullible, colossal arrogance in thinking that, and I quote, that his little finger was thicker than his father's waist. <laughs> Nonetheless, Solomon vividly imagines Lady Wisdom desperately shouting in the streets and crying out in the public square, Proverbs 1.20, perhaps even whispering through the window of his son's palace bedroom to please come and listen. Now, 280 years later, Isaiah pictures Lady Wisdom with felon honesty, ironically running from the law, and homeless truth stumbling around aimlessly with no place to go. Here is Isaiah 59, verses 14 and 15. Our courts oppose the righteous, and justice is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the streets, and honesty has been outlawed. Yes, truth is gone, and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. The Lord looked and was displeased to find there was no justice. Does that not sound like our 2019 culture? <laughs> With its questionable immorality, politics, values, religions, poverty, wealth, cultures, pastimes, and worldviews. Which brings us to something we so desperately need. We desperately need to push open bulgy envelope number seven, which contains both something new and something established. Look at chapter 59, verse 16. He was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed, so he himself stepped in to save them with his strong arm and his justice sustained them. He put on righteousness as his body armor and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed himself with a robe of vengeance and wrapped himself in a cloak of divine passion. Verse 16, so he himself stepped in. You sit on that for a minute. And maybe take that with you on your cafeteria tray today. So he himself stepped in and healed the greedy, stubborn people anyway. Not only to save us, comfort us, and lead us, but so much more that is praiseworthy. For one thing, the suffering servant's supreme sacrifice took the fight out of his father God. First, by ultimately repaying his enemies for all of their evil deeds, his global fury in the form of a raging flood filled with the fiery breath of God, falling on the raw and bleeding backs of all of his foes to the ends of the earth. We repaid them. And secondly, Restoring from east to west the respect and glory due his name and saving mankind from complete annihilation. Verse 20, chapter 59. The Redeemer will come to Jerusalem to buy back those in Israel who have turned from their sins, says the Lord. And this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit will not leave them, and neither will my words I have given them. They will be on your lips and on the lips of your children and your children's children forever. I, the Lord. Have spoken. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul used these very verses 
as a Roman scalpel to perform heart surgery against the hard and the proud Romans, unraveling a mystery that prophetic postman Isaiah had solved 740 years earlier. And here it is. The Redeemer, our next of kin, is not only doing this for all who repent of their sin, what he is really defeating here, mark this, is sin itself as it reigns in his people. A people who can now appropriately study God's word from generation to generation to generation until he comes back. So in conclusion, and maybe an obvious one, I won't insult your intelligence, but here we go. Be careful what bulging envelopes you are pushing. Of the seven that we have reviewed today, here they are once again for your review and consideration. Substandard shepherds, extreme ways, dangerous devotion, abnormal observances, unusual hands, feet, and lips, and greater degrees. There is only one envelope that you and I should be tearing open and extracting its contents. That envelope is something both firmly established and new every morning. And the note inside it reads, it delights the Lord when we delight in the Lord. As simple as that. It delights the Lord when we delight in the Lord. And this is always best displayed not only in how we handle our mail, but what mail we choose <coughs> to handle, let alone push, which marches us right up to Isaiah's P.S., postscript, to his 16th letter to us. And it's from chapter 58, verses 8b to 9a. This is language taken directly from the military realm with the advancing Jewish exodus in view, which Isaiah often alluded to. The ancient vanguard and rear guard offering protection in the form here of pillars of fire and pillars of cloud. And, as pointed out by Point of Grace in their 1998 song, Steady On, the postscript encourages us, each of us, to stay in lockstep with our Heavenly Father, making sure that we neither run on up ahead nor lag behind. Here it is. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then, when you call, the Lord will answer. Yes, here I am, he will quickly reply. Whatever happens next just might get you God's stamp of approval. But more on that next week. Until then... If you are so inclined to read along with us here, read the good news found in Isaiah chapters 60 to 62, and read it as if your life depended on it, <laughs> because it kind of does. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for these profound words, sometimes as, as harsh and brutal and honest as they are, and maybe that doesn't, that doesn't no. uh, ride too well with us at times, but it's... It's stuff we need to hear because the contrast is just as profound. That you stepped in and saved us anyway. And saved us incredibly, permanently, eternally. And you're all about the business of destroying sin. Sin altogether. Sin is a concept. Sin is a source. Sin is a power. It's been defeated. Defeated on the cross and ultimately defeated at the second coming. We just thank you again for the potential that that has in us even right now with thoughts that come thousands of times per second into our brains. Habits, inclinations, forms of entertainment, the way we treat people, what we say, what leaps off our tongue before we can ever grab it and shove it back. This is where you're all about the battle. This is where you have fought the good fight. And I just pray that we would do it as well, that we would be followers of you, and in so doing, that we would follow you by not lagging behind, and not running on up ahead. Both alternatives are extremely dangerous because we are prone to wander. I just pray that we would all remain in lockstep with you, whatever that means for each and every one of us in this room as these next days unfold, that you would keep us in lockstep with yourself, called from the front, protected from behind, and always with an ear at our beck and call. We just thank you again so much for the incredible opportunity that it is to walk this life with you side by side in lockstep with you. Thank you so much for the, the promise and the power of Isaiah's words that reveal as prophetically as he possibly knows how that these are complete.
complete and total reliable facts for us right here and right now in August of 2019. And I pray that you would, by the power of your spirit, make it so that we would never lag behind, that we would never run on ahead, but that we would hold your hand and never let go, walking in lockstep with you. And we just give you the glory for what can happen as a result of that in this very week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next week.